Good morning. Good to have you all here for worship at Woodlawn today, third Sunday after Pentecost. First few weeks after Pentecost, we focus on the Holy Christian Church and what that all entails, what it's all about. Today we focus on the leadership, the leaders that God raises up uh, to carry out the ministry, to lead to his people uh, in reaching out with the gospel, nurturing souls already in part of his flock, and then also reaching out to the community, to the harassed and helpless lost sheep, as Jesus uses the phrase, and Moses as well, uh, in our Old Testament lesson. At some point during the service today, please sign the red friendship register. You'll find along the center aisle of each pew. And the worship service is printed out in your service folder and also up on the screen. And we'll start with the Wells Connection. And then right after the Wells Connection, our opening hymn is God is Here as We His People. We're using the melody from the uh, 1993 hymnal, so that's what's printed on page three in your worship folder. So we start with this month's edition of the Wells Connection. Hi, I'm Wells President Mark Schrader. Our Synod has adopted the goal of planting 100 new home missions and enhancing 75 existing missions in the next 10 years. That effort has already begun, and these new missions are planning their ministries to create opportunities to tell their neighbors about Jesus. Here's one example of a church that's beginning to do just that in Durham, North Carolina. Walking with God all the time through your life is transformative. And if you want to have an impact on the world right around you, there's no better way to do that than sharing Jesus with somebody. This group hasn't yet launched public worship. As they prepare to, they're temporarily worshiping in their pastor's living room. And he says to you today, I forgive you. They were sent to Durham from a Wells church about 20 miles away in Raleigh to explore planting a new church in this growing area. Because of what you have done, Lord, we have nothing to fear. In order to do that, the group has been diligently trying to meet their neighbors and learn how to best reach them with the gospel. My son, who's seven, plays baseball. He plays Little League. And um, we made a very intentional decision to move him from the league that he had played in for three seasons to a league that's based in Durham. And, um, you know, for us, we live very close to communities in both Raleigh and Durham. And so we looked at the situation and we said, this will allow us the opportunity to um, be part of a Durham community and get to know people there better. And as a group, they have been volunteering with various nonprofit groups in Durham to meet the people that they are hoping to reach. We've just been trying to get into the city and just make those connections and just really get to know people in the area um, and, make, and try to make connections off of connections and just network that way to really just learn about the area and what's going to work here. As they come to understand the cultural makeup of their community and what its needs and concerns are, they are able to move into the practical steps necessary in order to launch their ministry publicly. So I would say we're moving along in kind of a logical, actionable sequence of, okay, now we need to have a space so that when we do go out and we invite people, where are we going to invite them to come to? So, you know, we're starting to go through those steps. And then there's just planning conversations happening, um, and eventually that's going to turn into more action. All of this work behind the scenes is happening with their neighbors in mind and how they can best serve the lost souls in Durham. We're just, by nature, we're not good listeners. By nature, we don't want to contextualize. We want them to understand us and, and hear what I'm saying and get into my shoes instead of, I want to walk a mile in yours. I want to understand what it's like to be a 20-year-old African-American growing up in Durham, North Carolina. Or I want to understand what it's like to be a 34-year-old tech woman who moved from Silicon Valley to here because they all got interesting stories and they all got different perspectives so that 
when we start talking Jesus, we, we can hit them where, where they need to hear it. Despite being located in what's traditionally referred to as the Bible Belt, Pastor Lang says that 70% of the people in this area are not currently connected to a church. They're not hearing the good news of Jesus. They're not hearing about the hope that they can have. Maybe they just never heard it. Nobody ever told them. Um, but we have an opportunity to do that, to tell them ab about a Savior who loves them, a Savior who died for them. And if we can start to shine lights into the darkness, this place will become a place of light. We want to make decisions not based on the people who are here, but based on the people we're trying to reach for Christ. So in other words, what am I willing to give up? Am I willing to set aside my ego, my pride, my wants, my desires, the way I think a church should be run, so that that person might know Jesus better and see their Savior? We ask the Holy Spirit to bless that, and God will bless it as He wills, and we trust that. All that we know is He told us to go, and so we need to go. Wells hopes to plant many other home mission churches over the next 10 years, much like this mission in Durham, that'll uniquely reach their neighbors with the life-saving message of the gospel of Christ. You can learn more about the 100 New Missions in 10 Years effort and how you can get involved at wells110.net.
Please stand. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Blessed are those who tra whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed are they whose sin the Lord does not count against them. Let us confess our sins to the Lord. Almighty and merciful Father, we have strayed from your ways like lost sheep. We have followed what we have devised and desired in our hearts. We have offended you and sinned against your holy law. We have done those things that we should not have done, and we have not done those things that we should have done. Have mercy on us, Lord. Spare us, forgive us, and restore us according to your promises in Christ Jesus. Our gracious Father in heaven has been merciful to us. He sent his only son, Jesus Christ, to be the atoning sacrifice for the sins of the whole world. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For this holy house and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Amen. In the peace of forgiveness, let us praise the Lord. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Let us pray. Almighty, eternal God, in the word of your apostles and prophets, you have proclaimed to us your saving will. Grant us faith to believe your promises that we may receive eternal salvation. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated. <clears throat> The Old Testament lesson for the third Sunday of the Pentecost season is from the book of Numbers. We read in chapter 27, beginning at verse 12. This also serves as the basis for our devotion today. The Lord said to Moses, go up this mountain in the Abarim range and see the land I've given the Israelites. After you have seen it, you too will be gathered to your people as your brother Aaron was. For when the community rebelled at the waters in the desert of Zin, both of you disobeyed my command to honor me as holy before their eyes. These were the waters of Meribah Kadesh in the desert of Zin. Moses said to the Lord, May the Lord, the God who gives breath to all living things, appoint someone over this community to go out and come in before them, one who will lead them out and bring them in, so the Lord's people will not be like sheep without a shepherd. So the Lord said to Moses, 
Take Joshua, son of Nun, a man in whom is the spirit of leadership, and lay your hand on him. Have him stand before Eleazar the priest and the entire assembly, and commission him in their presence. Give him some of your authority, so the whole Israelite community will obey him. He is to stand before Eleazar the priest, who will obtain decisions for him by inquiring of the Urim before the Lord. At his command, he and the entire community of the Israelites will go out, and at his command, they will come in. Moses did as the Lord commanded him. He took Joshua and had him stand before Eleazar the priest and the whole assembly. Then he laid his hands on him and commissioned him, as the Lord instructed through Moses. The word of the Lord. Our psalm for today is a new one for us as well, Psalm 100. Find the music uh, on page, uh, uh, in the front part of the hymnal. We'll sing the psalm together. Psalm 100. The New Testament lesson is from Paul's first letter to the Corinthians. We read in chapter 4, the first seven verses. Paul here talks about how God raised him up, called him to be a leader over his people, and he had founded this this congregation in Corinth, he and his associates. But there were some who would come into the congregation accusing Paul of being in it for the money, that he was just out to make a name for himself, and so here he has to defend his leadership saying that God had entrusted the mysteries of, the, of God to, him, to Paul and his associates. It's really nothing more than the good news, the gospel about Jesus Christ. But Paul says we're not to go beyond what God has, has written for us, revealed to us, and that's what the leaders of a, God's people are to do. This, then, is how you ought to regard us as servants of Christ, and as those entrusted with the mysteries God has revealed. Now it is required that those who have been given a trust must prove faithful. I care very little if I am judged by you or by any human court. Indeed, I do not even judge myself. 
My conscience is clear, but that doesn't make me innocent. It is the Lord who judges me. Therefore, judge nothing before the appointed time. Wait until the Lord comes. He will bring to light what is hidden in darkness and will expose the motives of the heart. At that time, each will receive their praise from God. Now, brothers and sisters, I have applied these things to myself and Apollos for your benefit, so that you may learn from us the meaning of the saying, don't go beyond what is written. Then you will not be puffed up in being a follower of one of us over against the other. For who makes you different from anyone else? What do you have that you did not receive? And if you did receive it, why do you boast as though you did not? The word of the Lord. Our hymn response is hymn 601, the first two verses. Please stand for the reading of the gospel. Today's gospel lesson is from St. Matthew, closing verses of chapter 9, first eight verses of chapter 10. Here Jesus, in the midst of his ministry, especially in Galilee, notices, sees all the people coming to him as he proclaims the the good news that he had come to be the Messiah, as he heals people. He describes them as being harassed and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. Their own religious leaders were not fulfilling the duties that they really had as leaders over God's people. And so Jesus said, there's lots of people here for God's kingdom and that we need to pray for leaders to bring them in. Then he turns around and the next moment we might even think that he says to the 12, guess what? You're the answer. You're the leaders that God is preparing to serve and to bring people into the kingdom. Jesus went through all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom, and healing every disease and sickness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them, because they were harassed and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. Jesus called his 12 disciples to him and gave them authority to drive out impure spirits and to heal every disease and sickness. These are the names of the 12 apostles. First, Simon, who's called Peter, and his brother Andrew. James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John. Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew, the tax collector. James, son of Alphaeus and Thaddeus. Simon the Zealot and Judas Iscariot, who would betray him. These 12 Jesus sent out with the following instructions. Do not go among the Gentiles or enter any town of the Samaritans. Go rather to the lost sheep of Israel. As you go, proclaim this message. The kingdom of heaven has come near. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse those who have leprosy, drive out demons. Freely you have received, freely give. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise be to you, O Christ. You may be seated. The hymn of the day is hymn 897. Lord Jesus, you have come. 897. Oh 
grace, mercy, and peace are yours in abundance from God our Father, through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Again, God's word for our devotion is the Old Testament lesson we read a few moments ago from Numbers chapter 27. Brothers and sisters in Christ, a little bit of background about the reading we're focusing on today. God's people of Israel had just arrived at the east side of the Jordan River after their long 40-year wandering in the wilderness, after God had miraculously and powerfully delivered them from their slavery in Egypt. Moses had been that leader for the past 40 years, especially called by God to be the, the spiritual and guiding leader, political leader, we might say, over his people on that journey. But, as we heard in the first part of the reading, Moses was not going to lead them into the promised land. God said, you can go up there in the, well, it turned out to be Mount Nebo, and you'll be able to see over, you'll be able to look over the Palestine, but you're not going in because at an earlier incident when the people had complained about being, not having water to drink, God said, told Moses, you speak to this rock and water will come out of it. But Moses and Aaron, in their anger, I guess, against the pe- at, towards the people, had taken their, their staffs and they had hit the rock instead and said, hey, we got to do this. They, what they did was they stole the glory and honor that was due the Lord for that miracle in their anger. And thus, Moses was told, you're not going to enter the promised land. Now, we might think that harsh and and cruel on God's part after all that Moses had done. He was a man, well, the Bible describes him as a, that he and God were like a man talking to each other, man to man. No, there wouldn't be another leader really like Moses. But Moses accepted his lot. He didn't whine and sulk about it. He showed his true concern for the people God had entrusted into his care. Didn't want them to be left on their own, to fend for themselves. And so he offered this prayer here that God would choose a leader, would raise up a leader who would take over for Moses. We'll talk more about who that was in a moment. Let's jump ahead to the gospel lesson then. As I said in my introduction to the reading, you know, Jesus is in the middle of his ministry and the people had just been coming to him in droves to hear him preach because he preached as someone with authority that he pointed to himself as that promised Messiah, that the kingdom of heaven was near, that he was the one who was going to bring salvation to God's people, to be that promised Messiah. And then, of course, they were impressed by the miracles that he performed as well. But they, he, he describes them, it says his heart, is, he had compassion on them. The Greek literally says that his, his guts were moved toward them. We would say his, he was moved in his heart toward them, but the Greek used the word guts, So he really was concerned, Jesus was, that these people needed help. They were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd is the picturesque phrase he uses. And so he told his disciples, we got to pray for people to take over. Because he wasn't going to be there that much longer, another year and a half or so at this point, until he suffered and died for the sins of the world on the cross, rose triumphantly from the grave to assure eternal life for all mankind. And so he tells the disciples, pray. And then he says, as I read it, you're the ones I'm sending out to start that. You are the ones who are going to be those leaders taking the message of salvation out into a world that's filled with people who are harassed and helpless. Now, jump ahead to today. In our congregation, we have said goodbye to a dear and beloved pastor, Pastor Wessel, but God has not left his people empty-handed. Because of our Living Hope merger that's taking place, we have a whole group of leaders, not just the pastors, but 12 faculty members. We elected a few weeks ago 15 lay leaders in the congregation, and we're blending together now our new congregation to take care of you, God's people, but also to bring in that harvest of lost and hurting souls in our community. And so we see from all three readings today, really, that the Lord provides shepherds for his flock. 
Now, in answer to Moses' prayer that the Lord would appoint someone to be the next leader, God tells Moses, it's Joshua, the son of Nun. Now, Joshua, well, he had been Moses' assistant for the last 40 years, almost. The Israelites, as they wandered in the wilderness, as a young man, he had led the Israelite troops into battle against the Amalekites, and God had, and they'd won a resounding victory with God's help. Uh, uh, Joshua was one of 70 elders that Moses had chosen to assist him in the work of guiding the Israelites, making judgments in cases and things like that. Joshua was one of the one of those leaders then who went up into uh, Mount Sinai where they confirmed the covenant of the law with God, God, between God and his people. And then he had gone with Moses further up into Mount Sinai where Moses received the two tablets with the Ten Commandments written on them. And then when the Israelites were approaching the borders of Palestine, he would, Joshua was one of the 12 spies sent in to check out the land, to see what it was like, see what the people were like. And he and his buddy Caleb brought back a glowing report and said, oh, we can do this. We can take this land because God has promised to be with us and that this is what God has promised to the patriarchs, to our forefathers. So Joshua had established a, a reputation for himself as, you know, being an outstanding leader for God's people. But there's one little phrase here that really sets him apart. And I don't know if you caught it as, as I read it. But the Lord said of, to Moses, Take Joshua, son of Nun, a man in whom is the spirit of leadership. And think of spirit with a capital S. Joshua was the right choice because he was filled with the spirit. Here was a man who, while serving under Moses, had, had learned what it means to serve the Lord faithfully, with trust and confidence and humility. As a young man, he had witnessed God's powerful hand in delivering his people from their slavery. He had heard God speaking to Moses and to the people. He watched as the Lord led them with that pillar of cloud by day and pillar of fire by night to bring them to where they were at that moment. And he had displayed his faith in the Lord, as I said, with the, as, as one of the spies, confident that God keeps his promises, that God is with us in leading his people. And that faith would be tested, would be put on display even more prominently as they crossed the Jordan River miraculously. The picture you have up on the screen is the Israelites marching around the city of Jericho. Remember God's promise there? We're all familiar with that account, how God literally caused those walls to fall down so that they could conquer that fortress city. And then for the next seven years, go up and down through Palestine and giving Joshua victory after victory until they had conquered and driven out the pagan tribes that were, that were living there. So Moses, or Joshua got the opportunity then, as God raised him up as the leader, he got the opportunity to show that, well, that faith and trust in the Lord as he led God's people. He was the right man at the right time. And as I said, all of our scripture readings really point us to that. Paul, in his, in his letter to the Corinthians, talks about how he was specially chosen, that he wasn't just in it for the money or to make a name for himself, but that God had entrusted to him the leadership, in a sense, as a missionary, to start congregations like in Corinth, to bring the mysteries of God, the, the wonderful news of salvation to people. That's what shepherds of God's people are to do, to be faithful in that work, not going beyond what God has revealed to them in his word, using their gifts and their talents to serve God's people, to reach out to hurting souls, to bring in that harvest, to lead God's people. When we look at the gospel lesson, as I said, Jesus did that with those 12. They obviously were, could not be the kind of leader Jesus was, as the Son of God, as the promised Messiah. But they were, after Pentecost, in the early decades after Jesus' ascension, they were the leaders of God's people as they established congregations throughout the Mediterranean world to take that message of salvation so that more and more people could be brought to faith, that those lost sheep could be brought in, that the harvest could be gathered, the harvest of souls. Now we come to our day and age. 
Well, to guide and direct that activity, to see that it's done with purpose and with passion, God still continues to raise up leaders, shepherds for his people, his flock. Moses and Joshua, Paul and Apollos, the 12 apostles, and a few weeks ago, our congregation elected 15 men to, who've offered their services, nominated by the pastors to, who see in them the gifts and the abilities to take over leadership positions in the congregation here in our new congregation of Living Hope Church and School. And they, together with the called work pastors and teachers, are the shepherds the Lord is raising up right now, placing over his sheep and in this place and at this time. Oh, some of us will be doing that work full-time, what we call the public ministry. Start with the teachers. Twelve faculty members have accepted calls, will be installed, commissioned, if you will, into their offices uh, uh, come August. Why? Because, well, we feel that in them the Spirit of God is working. They've offered themselves, trained them, been trained to bring that wonderful message of salvation to the children in those classrooms to carry out that work, uh, to, to bring in the lambs, to teach those lambs of God what it means to be a member of his flock. And not just in the religion classes that they teach, but incorporate that message of God's love and compassion and forgiveness throughout the school day, something that you really can't find in public education today. They'll be doing that work, leaders in those classrooms, leaders in our congregation, in that educational work that we do, touching souls, for all eternity. Then there's still the four of us, the pastors, on whom the Holy Spirit has called. Now we're reworking the calls. Mine's already been de uh, filled out, if you will. But for Pastor Oftenberg, uh, 17 years as pastor of Jordan, Jordan's congregation, my 32 years uh, among Woodlawn, Pastor Zarling and Wepner, three, four years at, over at Good Shepherd. Some of us you don't know very well, especially among those lay leaders. Some you do know very well. But God is using us, using our talents and abilities, the special training we've had as pastors in leading a congregation with worship practices and, and teaching Bible classes and the like, all the skills necessary to lead you into God's Word, lead you into your relationship with Jesus as your Savior. That work will continue. Now, we have, we're sinners too. We have our strengths. We have our weaknesses. But by God's grace and the work of the Holy Spirit in our hearts, we are offering ourselves to be the Lord's shepherds in Living Hope Congregation. We're thankful for the opportunity to do that, working together with those lay leaders and the teachers as a staff, all because we want to touch hearts and souls with that message of the gospel. Those of you who already know that message and in our community where people still don't know Jesus as our Savior. As I said, we've elected those lay people. Names were printed in the service folder a few weeks back, posted on the bulletin board. Pray for them. Pray for all of us that the Spirit continue to work in our hearts and, and make, make us all faithful workers, confident in the Lord's promise promises dedicated to that ministry of being God's shepherds and leaders in his flock here. To assist us in that work, though, it's you guys, men and women, who've been touched by that gospel message, moved to show your gratitude and, and joy for that message, to offer yourselves as living sacrifices. That's part of your spiritual worship. In the, in the announcements the last few weeks and today again, all kinds of opportunities for you to step up and get involved. And, and, and we hope that literally hundreds of you will do that in the coming weeks and months, whether that's your, your musical gifts, leadership gifts, serving on committees and, and, and taking care of projects that need to be done, assisting in Sunday school and, and the children's ministries, all of that. We need you. And God is raising you up to assist those leaders in the congregation so that that ministry can be carried out as fully and energetically as possible. Now, when the Lord appointed Joshua to be the successor, 
They had that commissioning ceremony, the laying on of hands. And you'll see that a number of times in the next couple of months with the, with the lay leaders, with the pastors, with the faculty. Why do that? Well, in, this, in the case of Joshua and Moses, it was so that all Israel will know that God had chosen this man, Joshua, that they were to rally around him and follow him just as they had Moses. And in the weeks to come, when we install the pastors, teachers, and lay leaders, well, like I said, some will be new to you. Some you won't know. Others you'll know very well. But we are all, we've all been brought together by the Lord to provide care for the sheep who are already part of his flock here and to reach out to those hurting souls who desperately need what we have to share with them. That wonderful news of a compassionate, good shepherd who laid down his life for them and for us so that all of us could be with him forever in heaven. So the, may the Lord bless our work together as we feed his shop, sheep and, make that, and work on that harvest of souls. Amen. Please stand. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Amen. We continue now with confessing our faith using the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Heavenly Father, trusting in your continued blessings of faith, of health, and of employment, we bring our offerings to you. Grant us your Holy Spirit that whatever we receive as income, as gift, as inheritance, all that you pour out upon us, we regard them as your blessings and are then moved out of gratitude and joy to return a portion of them to, to you for work in your kingdom. May we never forget that as your redeemed children, we are managers of many talents and gifts that you give to us. May we resolve to use them faithfully. We ask all this for Jesus' sake. Amen. In our special prayers today, we include a prayer on behalf of fathers, on, on commemoration of Father's Day. And it's also pleased our Father in heaven to call to her eternal rest, uh, Betty Spitzer, longtime member of, of Jordan, uh, who passed away on Monday at the age of 97. The funeral will be held uh, July 15th. More details are still to be worked out. So we bow our heads and pray. O oh Lord, hear our praise and give ear to the voice of our prayers. Today again we enter your gates with thanksgiving and your courts with praise. You are righteous, and your steadfast love abides forever. We are your people and the sheep of your pastor, pasture. We serve you with gladness and come into your presence with rejoicing. Lord, you've shown us your love by sending Jesus Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. Yes, Lord, we indeed are frail and wandering sheep, harassed and helpless by the, the temptations of our, and philosophies of our society today. So, Lord, forgive us our sins and come fill us with your Holy Spirit through faith in Jesus as our Savior. Fill us with knowledge and zeal to do your will. Help us to teach your word and have compassion for those who have not yet heard that message. Open our eyes to the harvest and make us willing laborers, leaders, and members together to gather it in. We ask this in the name of the Lord of the harvest, our Savior who reconciled us by his death and has given us new life and eternal life. And Heavenly Father, 
We thank you for all the blessings which you displayed to our poured out on our sister in Christ, Betty Spitzer, whom you've now called to glory in heaven. We praise you for making her, her your child in baptism, sustaining her faith through the good news about Jesus all her life. May that peace and the promise of your son's atoning sacrifice on the cross and his empty tomb bring assurance to the hearts of John and his family and all who mourn this death. Help us always to live in joyful anticipation of that day when you will call us from our graves, reunite us with Betty and all believers, and fill us with the perfect joy and blessings in your presence forever. And Heavenly Father, we thank you for providing earthly fathers. The care they give and the compassion they are to show are to be a reflection of your love toward us. Help all the fathers in our midst in that most important work of bringing up their children in the training and instruction of the Lord, being the spiritual leaders in their families. Let your grace and forgiveness always be at the heart of their family leadership. Strengthen them to be models for their children and for their community by their godly lives and bless all that they do to display that Christian fatherhood and faith in, in, in our midst. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Our closing hymn is hymn number 710. Especially you may want to follow along in the hymnal. This is a, a new one for us. Uh, listen carefully to it. Give it your best effort. 710, Beneath the Cross.
We stand and pray. Almighty God, we thank you for teaching us the things you want us to believe and do. Help us by your Holy Spirit to keep your word in pure hearts, that we may be strengthened in faith, guided in holiness, and comforted in life and death. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. And we pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Now, brothers and sisters, go in peace. Live in harmony with one another. Serve the Lord with gladness. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with his favor and give you peace. Amen. May be seated for our closing hymn, 729, the first three verses. Son of God, eternal Savior.
Greetings again to all of you in the name of the Lord Jesus. It was good to have had you here for our worship service today, especially guests who are joining us. Hope you'll come back again, worship with us again soon. Um, lots of announcements printed out in the blue uh, announcement sheet on the table as you leave. Uh, be sure to pick one up as you exit the sanctuary. A couple highlights from that. We continue on Wednesday with uh, work projects in, in a sense, playing musical chairs or musical classrooms with all the furniture uh, getting 15 uh, classrooms uh, ready for uh, our school year, and including the daycare. So we need lots of help between 1 and 8 o'clock on Wednesdays. There's a sign-up genius uh, link uh, in, your, your, in those announcements. Um, you don't have to serve, obviously, for all seven hours, but if you can give us an hour or two of moving furniture or painting uh, walls, uh, things like that, we'd be glad to have all the help we can get. Um, one of the other one, uh, volunteer opportunities we want to highlight is choir. We are having uh, our closing service, in a sense, closing service here in our sanctuary on the 1st and 2nd of July, and we are doing some special things in that service, and we have the choir piece, a selection, um, one that we sang in the last couple of years. A rehearsal will be, the next rehearsal will be on the 29th, Thursday the 29th at 7 o'clock. And then we're also looking for recruit choir members for our new choir, the joint choir. Um, they'll be singing for the opening services at the North Campus on July 9th. Um, and so if you are able to come um, to be one, in one or both of those groups, um, please come to that rehearsal at 7 o'clock on the 29th. Um, that's the services on the first and second. Like I said, there'll be a special message and some, like I say, some closing ceremonies, if you will, uh, for our, our time here in this sanctuary. Um, there's a sample of one of the chairs we're looking at for in the new sanctuary. Um, uh, uh, take a test drive, if you will. Uh, see how you like it. If you have any comments about it, you can share those with, with me. Um, I don't know, is there anybody else from the property committee here? I don't think so. Joel Davis, the new vice chairman of our congregation, right, Joel? Okay, vice, vice President of the New Congregation, Living Hope. You could also share that, those with him if you have. And there'll be other samples that we'll try out too. So, um, And again, happy Father's Day to all of you for whom that applies. God be with you. Mm -hmm.